Okay. Um, so good afternoon. I'm going to. Uh, my name is Omri. I'm going to be speaking about context correlation and decorrelation, and this is work in collaboration with uh, Stefano Fuzzi and Mattia Rigotti in uh, Colombia. Okay. So context. You see the stimulus. You want to cross the street. Do you look left or right? That obviously depends if we are in the UK or US or Israel. That will have different answers, which means that it depends on the context you're in. So that's sort of my topic today. A uh, general overview. I'm going to be speaking about context-dependent decisions, um, why they cause correlation in the input structure, why this, these correlations cause difficulties when you want to make decisions, how to decorrelate the input by using randomly connected neurons, and a new analysis technique for the capacity of the perceptron, which will give some insight into these problems. And finally, some application of that. OK. So first of all, why study context? Well, the uh, notion is that we are not stimulus response machines, as the, let's say, the behaviorism uh, um, would say. But our actions are actually due to an interaction between both an in internal state and external stimulus. And studying context and such interactions may be a gateway to understand higher cognitive functions. So I'm going to do, give an example problem. OK. Let's say my inner state now is that I think I'm in the UK. I look to the right of the street, and I cross. And the external stimulus is now that I cross safely. I use this combination of, external, of internal and external input to make a decision. Let's say I am indeed in the UK. If, however, I look to the right, I cross the street, and I get a different external input, I might get a different conclusion. <laughs> this might also happen if you look left, so be careful. And of course, vice versa, I can have different combinations of external and internal inputs. Now, in general, what I'm interested in is looking at a mental state or internal and external stimulus and how they combine to give me a decision, which in my case, I'll be studying a perceptron as the decision-making machine. So note that the input to this decision perceptron is both the external and the internal input, uh, state. It's a, a combined input. Now, what do I mean by correlation in inputs? So let's look at the geometry of the input space. And if we are looking at perceptrons, then this is quite important, as it will determine the capacity or the um, classification abilities of a perceptron. First, we'll consider just a single binary neuron that represents my internal state. Let's say it is active if I'm in the UK. It is inactive if I'm in Israel. And then I'll have one external binary neuron, which says, let's say, it is inactive if I'm hit by a car, and it is active if I'm safely across the street. And now I consider the four inputs. Again, an input is the combined external internal state mentioned above. Let's say I'm in the UK and I cross safely, and I'm hit by a car, then this would be correspond to this point. UK and safe would be here, and the other two options will be over here. So these are my input vectors. And so obviously, there were just two neurons, so it's in a 2D plane. Let's see what happens if I add more neurons to there. Let's say, assume that the neuronal population for each state is more than just one neuron. So let's say I add another internal neuron. Now, for instance, that neuron can also be active for UK and inactive for Israel, in which case, these two points will move up. Note that I am still in a 2D manifold, if, even if though it's part of a 3D space. Maybe that neuron actually is the opposite way. It's inactive in the UK and active in Israel. Again, I'm in a 2D uh, space. So the input is going to be in a 2D manifold regardless of the size of the respective external and internal populations. And this sort of makes sense since we're taking a, a low dimensional thing, only the two options, UK, Israel, hit or safe, and projecting it to some large space of neurons. And then that's the input to my perceptron. So it's not so much of a surprise. But this can be a problem if I'm looking at a perceptron. Because a perceptron, if you give it 
four points in a 2D space, you might be forced to make a decision which is hard or impossible in this case for a perceptron to make. And in principle, we, uh, for many of the cases, once you think of a bit more than two by two, than two options, internal and two external, then we can show that the probability of not encountering something like this is exponentially small. So you will pretty much always encounter such things if you want some flexibility in your decisions. So what can we do about this? Well, what can we do is we can do is introduce neurons with mixed selectivity. So before I had a pool of neurons for the internal state, another pool of neurons for the external state. But I didn't have any neurons which were combined. So now what happens if I have a neuron that only fires where, when I'm both in Israel and I cross safely? So this neuron will, will now move only one of the points up in 3D space. And that will allow me to make a linear separation. So the, the problem is now linearly separable, and my sort of the dimensionality of my uh, input space increased. Now, how, what, what do I do? How do I get these uh, mixed selective neurons? So there, in principle, you can also think of this in the machine learning literature as a hidden layer. You have an, an input layer which is not enough to, gain, to get a, to solve all functions, and I introduce a hidden layer, and that can solve the problem. Now, I can either engineer, let's say, back propagation, train my network, the hidden layer, to be the exact one I want, or I can just take a bunch of neurons, randomly connect them, and hope for the best, which is what we do. And this is following the work of um, Rigotti et al. Uh, with random con randomly connected neurons. So before I had the mental and internal and external states giving a decision, now I have another stage where I take randomly connected neurons. So these are neurons which receive fixed random connections. Again, as Larry mentioned this morning, fixed random means completely unrelated to the task I'm trying to solve here, predetermined. And I have some nonlinearity. In my case, I'd be considering binary plus minus one neurons for all three of these things. So the nonlinearity will be a threshold in nonlinearity. And the decision will have access to all three pools of neurons. And that should make the task solvable, whereas it wasn't before. So, yeah. so besides the issue of learning versus fixed carbon connectivity, uh, in a simple, straightforward, uh, simple architecture would be that the external, that the, the decision would be to get input only from the LCN. LCN. So in principle, in principle it, is, it is possible to get the in the, to solve only using the RCNs. Um, the analysis we have is um, actually, conf I mean, the way we did it is using all three, but actually the analysis holds also when you eliminate these parts, and it will actually de mostly depend on the RCNs. Right. You can do it with the second order kernels as well. So you can, you can take some other, I mean, like a, a non-linearity. So you, in principle, you can say, well, if I have um, a non-linearly separable problem, then it is maybe separable with a non-linearity, right, instead of using a line using some curve. But the thing is, the problem is not just the linearity. So if I have a, a, the input in a low-dimensional manifold, then perhaps if I have a two by two, and then I, you can give me nice curves which will separate them. But if I have a, a ten by te a ten dimensional manifold, which should have been a hundred dimensional, and so it might be very hard to construct a nonlinear function which will help. So I think the problem is more the input dimensionality than the fact that I'm using a linear separability. Right, the linear separability is but are the kernel. Yeah, the kernel effectively projects it to some high dimension. Yeah. Um, in yeah, in, prin yeah, in principle, in infinite that's dimensions. A, that's an example of a kernel. Yeah, that's, but yeah, so that's, that's, a, 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 well, let's say, a simple way. Then, then kernels you can do in principle. I'm just saying because you mentioned second order features, and then you can, if you use a second order for the uh, polynomial kernel, that would also. Yeah, so the, I mean, I, I, you can view this as, a, um, in my view, a simple way to get a kernel, mm -hmm. uh, which I can also is, uh, analyze uh, fully. So now the input is going to be the state plus stimulus plus RCNs. And we're interested, of course, in the scaling, so not only two internal and two external states, but let's say M internal and N external states, which will give us 
an m plus n dimensional manifold with the, po with the maximum possible uh, input combinations, which is m times n. So yeah. What is the uh, separation between internal and external? So the internal and external the, the, is two different pools of neurons. Let's say this. It might be it might be two different modalities. It might so the right, so but the, the name internal and external is arbitrary. The name internal and external is from the motivation of thinking of context. But, model, but for the model point of view, it has it's two populations which are represented in distinct uh, in the distinct pair. Yeah. It is also applicable to two modules. So now a bit of math. I'm going to look at the input matrix. So this is like a, a perceptron input matrix. The columns are the input patterns, and the rows are the neurons. So I have n neurons for the internal state, another, another n neurons for the external state, and m times n, or p n equals m times n, different input combinations. And I have, for instance, x1 and y1, x1 and y2, all different combinations of x and y until xm and yn. Okay, so that's, and each, uh, each entry here is a plus or minus one. Mu indexes the pattern, I indexes the neuron. A standard thing, the only sort of non-standard thing is that I sort of have a, this particular structure for the input. And now, for instance, let's look at the example we just had. So we had two different external, internal states, let's say x1 and x2, and these would be y1 and y2, so I have four by 2n matrix, which only has a rank of three and not four. By the way, if you're bothered by the rank three and two-dimensional, one of them is the bias. So it's a two-dimensional manifold that does not intersect the origin. Uh, and then, so now what happens when I introduce these RCNs? So the RCNs are gonna be additional neurons, which have implement some random nonlinear function of basically all of, the, all of the rows above them. So a particular neuron will have some function of all of that's above it. So f of x1 and y1 here, f of x1 and y2 here, and another neuron will have a diff different function g. Of course, f and g come from the same distribution, but there are different realizations of it. So I have some n RCN here. Okay, these are the RCNs mentioned here. Now, what do I expect these RCNs to do? So I had a problem that I had a low dimensional matrix and I wanted to be higher dimension. I expect these RCNs to somehow increase the rank of the matrix. And indeed, that's what happens. If I take, let's say, uh, seven and 15 as the number of states and uh, stimuli, then I have, I'm beginning with M plus N, minus one to be exact, and the maximum rank is N times N. And you can see that each RCN that I add will increase the rank of the matrix by one. So yes, it works. If you add this mixed selectivity in this way, it increases the rank. And now we're interested in the perceptron, right? So how far do we need to go in order to solve this? So do we have to go all the way here? I mean, is this enough? Is this, what, what do we need to, so to do in order to solve this? So to do that, we're going to briefly look at the perceptron, which fortunately has been introduced earlier today. So we have several points in an n-dimensional space. That's the SIMU. Our goal is to find weights WI such that the class or the label eta mu of each pattern, that's the blue versus red or plus versus minus one, will, will uh, correctly classify this and you can also if you want it, uh, demand some margin, some kappa, a, a, fine, a positive number which will determine some margin. And the perceptron theorem, as was mentioned this morning, is that for kappa equals zero, then the maximum number of patterns you can have is two times the number of inputs. So this means that we can make a guess, and if the rank is somehow equivalent to the number of inputs, then the minimum number of inputs you need is p over two, so the number of RCNs will be the number of inputs m times n divided by two minus the initial dimension. So this guess means that the number of RCN will scale linearly with the complexity of the problem, the number of states or transitions that you need to make. And 
Okay, but that doesn't give us any robustness, this kappa equals zero. If we want some robustness of the solution, then we need to increase the learning margin. And so now I'm going to introduce a new technique to analyze the perceptual margin for correlated inputs and use that to see what the RCNs do and how it works. Correlated, you mean a different uh, example? The correlation? Correlation, yeah, this is what is known, let's say, as semantic. There's a special in semantics. This will be semantic. Correlation across columns due to the structure of the XY. So short reminder for uh, singular value decomposition, which I'm going to use here. If you take any matrix, I'm going to take the input matrix to the perceptron, you can decompose it to a product of a unitary matrix, a diagonal one, and another unitary matrix. You have this in the algebraic and geometric version for those who like both things, either variety. And you can think of it as a rotation, scaling rotation, whichever way you want. That matrix is 2n by p, which will separate to a unitary that is 2n by 2n, a diagonal which is 2n by p, since it's rectangular, and a unitary which is p by p. Uh, actually, this last, the, most of these will be zeros, so this part of the unitary can be ignored. But that's sort of the uh, decomposition of a matrix, singular value decomposition. Now what I'm going to do is plug this into the perceptron formula and see what happens. So this was the perceptron formula. Find wi such that this quantity is larger than kappa. I'm going to plug in the SVD. I'm putting r and not p here since some of the lambdas might be zero. So this is actually the rank of the matrix, number of non-zero lambdas. Sorry. So this is just putting in this thing. But now, this looks also a bit like a perceptron, only with R inputs. And this thing, which should have been the weights, and this unitary thing is the input matrix. So I'm going to try and solve a reduced problem of the V mu nu perceptron. Okay, so I had the original problem, finding Ws for the Si's, and I'm with some label eta, and I'm now going to solve a reduced problem of finding W tilde for V with the same etas. And this is just a perceptron problem with R. How many views? How many R. So the, the uh, V mu nu is, going, is an R by P matrix. So I have you, mu, yeah, mu goes, yeah, P equations. R is smaller equal than P. R is the rank of the matrix, oh, see, which is the sort of the number of R is. So this is a, a per se, if, if it's a full rank matrix, then this is like an alpha equals one perceptron. If it's a lower, lower rank matrix, then it's alpha larger than one perceptron. Okay, so this is just a unitary matrix. So I expect this perceptron actually to be a quite easy perceptron to solve. And I mean, all of the singularities are sort of hidden away. And so I'm going to try and solve this perceptron. But once I have solved it, I, I got this W tilde, but I, I want a W. Um, just a quick note, the fact that the rank of the S, this R, is the number of inputs to the reduced perceptron sort of justifies the, the intuition I had that looking at the rank is the same as looking at the number of inputs to the perceptron. And that's, so that the P max is N over 2, using the rank as a... Um, using the rank of the matrix as sort of an input in number of inputs to the perceptron is in a way formalized when you do this decomposition. And now once I found W tilde, I can do a pseudo inverse. So I want this thing to be equal to the whatever is in the parentheses, which means I want the product of U times W to be equal to W tilde divided by the, the singular values which means, which I can do by taking the pseudo inverse of the matrix U. Okay, so again, I had the original problem. I derived a reduced problem V, which is the unitary matrix. I solved this problem, found W tilde, and used the pseudo inverse of the uni other unitary matrix to find the weights for the original problem. Okay? One thing I haven't exactly said here is kappa, or kappa tilde. 
in order for kappa to make sense, I need to normalize w. Otherwise, you can just double w's and kappa will double. So the norm of w is going to be 1. The sum of w squared is going to be 1. Once I do this, it's no longer guaranteed. So if w tilde was normalized to 1, and I got a certain kappa tilde, and now I do the pseudo inverse, so the pseudo inverse of a unitary matrix is not going to change the norm of w. But this is. So if I know the norm of this thing, that will tell me the relation between kappa and kappa tilde. So in order to find the norm of this thing, I need to know what are. So, so I, I'm going to sort of. A question. Are the yeah. two mean mu's sufficiently uncorrelated so that you can use all the steps on the machine? So the v, v is a unitary matrix uh, in principle, which. Um, so what is the advantage of this over the original problem? So the, again, I'm not, let's say, as a learn, that's not what I'm going to say. This is not a learning rule. Okay? I'm not saying that the, the, the learning rule is to solve this and then do the pseudo inverse, which I have no, no clue how to define even as a learning rule. This is an analysis tool. Right. So, you started with the problem of correlation. Yeah, but the, so the correlation now hides, in a sense, in the lambdas. Now, why not in the u or in the v? How do you know they are not correlated? Okay, so there. Um, First, um, so uh, disclosure. This is still a work in progress. Uh, I have. Uh, but that's so assumption, right? yeah. So the, yeah. That, so um, the assumption is that the v is is not the, that solving the. Let's say that I can I can tell you what kappa tilde is going to be, and for all the cases that I found, it works so far. I mean, but I, I don't have yet a, um, a proof of this. Okay, that's yeah. Assumption. Yes. Okay. So this is what I wanted to find. So this, the norm of this thing, so the norm of w is going to be the norm of this w tilde divided by the singular values. Again, I'm going to assume that w tilde are more or less the same for all v's. Uh, in practice, that's nearly always the case. And, I'm all, and then I have, all I need to know is, so, and then I also need to know what kappa tilde is. And kappa tilde, I actually, uh, of, a, of a unitary matrix, um, it can be shown that it's, if you, have a, if you have an uncorrelated unitary matrix and you try to find out what kappa tilde is, it's going to be 1 over the square root of the size of the matrix. Um, I can later discuss why and show it. So small eigenvalues are bad? Yeah. So, so eigenvalues are throughout, right? Yeah, throughout, yeah. You zoom in. I mean, the point is, unless I can buy really zero and really, and if you, what you need is a gap between the zero ones and the number. Which is exactly what you're going to have when you introduce LCNs, actually. So I, I'll, I'll show what happens when you, when you do that. Um, so, so now what you have is the, that kappa depends on the singular values. So we need to know what are the singular values of a matrix with this type of correlations I just showed. So how do you compute singular values? Well, to do SVD, one of the ways is simply to take, instead of S, take S, S transpose, or S transpose S, and do the eigen decomposition of that. When you do that, it will give you the square of the singular values and the unitary matrix as the eigenvectors. So for instance, if we take this little example here, and now I'm going to make an, a simplified assumption that all of these x and y's are orthogonal. Okay, so which will be true, let's say, in the n goes to infinity case. So let's just compute this matrix, this first thing here. So if I take this column and multiply it by itself, it, and all of them are plus minus 1, I'm just going to get 2n, which is what I have here, n times 2. If I take this column times this one, I'm going to get 1n from this part, and 0 from this part. So this is 1. I can continue the whole way. I hope you believe me that this is the matrix that you get. And these are the, the eigenvalues, which are the squared, square of the singular values. It's rank 3, as, so, as I said before. In general, this matrix can be calculated for any m and n. It's going to be a block matrix. And the eigenvalues can also be found. And they are going to be m plus n with the multiplicity of 1, m 
n times n m times and zero most of them, especially when m and n are large. Okay, so again that sort of agrees with the intuition. Now what happens when you add RCNs? So when you add RCNs, the diagonal term just, if this was 2n, it's now going to be 2n plus the number of RCNs. These terms, zero is still going to be zero, I mean the, the zero is still going to be zero because, okay, so let, this term is going to be something that is less than the full number of RCNs and more than zeros because there's some linear, non-linearity, but it has the same, half of the same in arguments. So there's going to be some fraction. This can in general depend on the specific nonlinearity I choose. For the threshold nonlinearity, this fraction is one third, which means that the one or the n is now going to be n plus one third the number of RCNs. And zeros, if there was nothing in common in the x and y's, then there's going to be nothing in common between the RCNs, which in turn allows me to calculate what the eigenvalues of the matrix with RCNs is going to be. So this is an example. The red points is from the analytical formula. This m plus n, m, n, and all the zeros. Again, this is not exactly zero because I have some RCNs. So it's going to be a bit above. And the blue are a specific realization. Again, the patterns are not exactly orthogonal. n is not infinity. That's why I have the blue lines are not exactly the red lines. But it still gives the right uh, order of magnitude. It's, uh, in my view, a good approximation. So now I'm going to want to use this to find what was the norm of W to find out what was the relation between kappa and kappa tilde and the margin. So this was kappa. Kappa is going to depend, as mentioned here, on the small eigenvalues. Specifically here, since I have a large multiplicity of the minimal eigenvalues, it's pretty much going to depend only on that one. So the smallest eigenvalues is one-third nRCN, and its multiplicity is m times n, which means that kappa is going to be roughly the square root of the number of RCNs divided by m times n. Now, if I want a given level of robustness, so I fix kappa, the number of RCNs is again linear in the complexity of the task. So also for the robustness, the result again is that the number of RCNs is linear in the complexity. And I'm going to show a simulation of how this whole thing works. So far, I've just focused on the input. But let's say this, this output can also be part of the input. It can be part of the internal states. That's sort of a, if, we, if we want to think now of, of, of why I'm calling it internal and external, and not just two different inputs, then the case of some recurrency, if where my context actually changes as a result of what happens, there there is some distinction between the internal and external. So now, the mental states are going to be the output of the decision. So instead of the decision being some uncorrelated thing, the, the neurons of the mental state are going to be the perceptrons. So my new scheme is actually recurrent neurons for the mental states, which read out all of the others. OK, so now. The motivation is, let's say, this example. I want to change my mental state depending on the external stimulus and my current mental state. So if I want to have, let's say, several attractors describing the current mental state and it, it transitions between them, which depend both on the external stimulus and on where I started, then that's the motivation. So the setting is I have m attractor states n plus one external inputs, one of them signals stay where you are, and the other elicit random transitions. So if I start here and I get y0, I want to stay here. And if I get y1, I make some set of transitions. If I get y2, I get another set of transitions. And now I want to see how this scales, how many. So I want to test the robustness and the scaling of this system. First, I train the recurrent neurons as perceptrons that have to satisfy all of these constraints here. And while I'm going for some margin, since I want robustness. Next, I'm going to perturb each attractor state by flipping 3% of the bits of the recurrent neurons of the mental state. 
which will of course propagate to much more bit flips in the randomly connected neurons. And then I'm going to simply run this perceptron several times to see whether it converges back to the original state. And now for a given task complexity, how many RCNs do you need to get a 100% recovery from this perturbation? I expect it to be linear. So, so let me just understand. Yeah. Before you had uh, a set of inputs, internal and external, and some decisions. Yes. Uh, and not now, so now the labels are transitions. So the labels now, I mean, before I had no, the etas were uncorrelated to the SIs before. The, the so labels. The that were imposed, right? Yeah, yeah just choose, chose a random labeling. Right. But now I have a correlation, actually. So the, let's say if I have, so if I have SI mu, which has the x and the y, and I had eta mu, which was just random. So now eta mu is actually going to be x. It's going to be one of the x's. Since if I'm in state x2 and I get y3, I want to move to x4. So this means that if you look at, so now first of all I have, OK, so, okay, so now I have eta i mu, actually, where i goes from 1 to n from 1 to n here. And if I take, if I want to move from x2 to x4, then the eta i, and, and let's say this is mu, this is my specific mu, the eta i mu will be s, uh, will be x4 right. okay, so, i. So, these are, these are the so the eta is actually a set of transitions that you impose. Yes. You want to learn. Yeah. But, but on one set or Okay, no, so I have a given transition scheme, which is you can view as, let's say, a graph of all the, um, all of the mental states and arrows, which say if you start here and you give a given um, input, then you're going. That's where you're going to get. Okay, now, so one, one set of transitions. Yeah, but yeah, one one scheme. And you, of, and you iterate. And I, and, I, and I iterated several times. Now, I mean, this, in principle, this can pose, I mean, if, if, I, if my scheme was one where I had externally you know, y1 here and y1 again here, then this sort of doesn't make any sense since I would sort of just it, it, it right there. But I can have, um, I think, quite a few interesting schemes without this. And then, and then, and still, of course, once, you have all of the y zeros going here, then you can have tractors. So this is the, the number of LCNs, which indeed grows linearly with the, uh, five minutes? Uh, the number of LCNs which goes linearly with the complexity of the task as expected. Um, again, my analysis was not for the correlated case, so this just shows that it works also for slightly more complicated case. And also the number, I think, is not too large. So if you have 40 internal states and five different transitions, you can still do this with a rather modest number of RCNs. Um, so to conclude, I, I hope I showed that context problems introduce correlations in the input, which might pose a problem when you're trying to make decisions. Um, I introduced a new technique for analyzing the capacity of the perceptron using the SVD, which allows both to study the scaling of the problem and of the solution using RCNs. And I showed that RCNs can uh, decorrelate the input when the number needed increases linearly with the task complexity, which incidentally, this also gives a, a nice way to characterize the complexity. So if you draw me a scheme such as this, I can estimate its complexity and the number of LCNs that will be needed to solve it. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. There is enough time for one question. I think it's on the Katie network. Mm -hmm. Sorry.
think in principle you can I mean this is sort of the you know, not of the simplest, but a simple way to to look at the general problem of taking this um, an input which has two components and the correlations that ensue from that and sort of the, without any other uh, assumptions. But gating, in principle, um, you you can think of this as, as some form of gating if you have yeah, since the same uh, the same external input will do two different things depending on an internal variable. So you can think of the internal variable as a gating variable. Uh, but, but so if you do indeed think the, the problem is coming really from the work of memory like what the police officers are going to assist for a long time and not worry about all the possible combinations this thing could invoke um, so that you can have these express free alternatives, that leads to a simple ultimate answer. I'm not sure I understood the question. No, okay. No, yeah. So I, I'm quite confused. Where did you use the fact that the RCNs are Rs? Random. The R is random, so I didn't use the fact. The R is recurring. Is random, so I didn't use any oh, recurrency. It's random, but not recurring. Yeah. So, but what what is it? The random, the R C Ns. Yeah. So I, I just take a, a, a random a feed, forward, a a feed forward selection from the random selection from the internal and external population, just a random mixture with the thresholding. So you wait one. You just sample random. You can either take Gaussian on all of them, or you can take plus minus one on half of them. It doesn't really matter. And then threshold. And then threshold. Yes. Yeah. Some nonlinear combination of the of the two populations of the internal and external. And again, to the question of internal states. So I guess it's, it's related to what Peter was asking. As far as most of the analysis, perhaps of the last one, does that uh, take them an equal footing, like two sources of yeah. information, but. I think we have, we have an intuition that context and stimulus is not the same. Are not the same. So, I mean, pretty much you said it. So, the, the analysis is for the input and the geometry of the input and the dimensionality of the input. Uh, now, this, this analysis sort of ignores any correlation to the output. And when you think of internal, st the, the motivation came from internal states. For the analysis, I sort of ignored that. Okay, but ultimately, but ultimately and, but, but, and that's why they, I put the application at the end. So for the application at the end, there is a difference, and the context is recurrent, and the scaling still works, even though I ignored it in the analysis. That's, that's why I put it, this analysis as well.